Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and I was on Dragon's Den. They emailed me, said they'd give me the pitch of my choice, and I decided I would do a certain pitch, 10% royalty on Brantford Bucks, $100,000 I wanted. I went on the show, and last minute, they made me sign a consent form, and it said they gave them the right to defame me, and that I couldn't sue them. Well, they went and defamed me, and now I sued them, and they're claiming the consent form gives them immunity, and that's what this case is all about. Every time you go to a new site and you click, I agree, I consent, and then you go on without reading it. I want it to say and those companies to know that you can't put stuff in there that you got no right to do. So that you can't say, uh, make a person consent to them using information they get to defame you. Now they can use it to disparage you, shame you, ridicule you. Yeah, but not defame. That means lie with. And, or do other things, defraud you. Ah, you signed the consent. You didn't realize that it said we could defraud you and we got into business later and I defrauded you. All right, and go rape your wife. You can't complain. Who knows what they put in these things. The point is they shouldn't be allowed to put anything they want. And the fact they put it in there means they shouldn't be able to have it necessarily. And that's what this is about. CBC put in one word, defamation, that said that they could disparage, they could ridicule, they could use the video of the truth to make fun of me. I don't mind. But they can't defame me with the truth. Defamation means a lie. I have to prove a lie. And I think I did. So here are the facta, my first factum against the decision of Justice Lofchick on the breach of contract because they didn't show my pitch at all. And then the decision of Justice uh, Errol, the factum on his decision not to let me sue for defamation. And these are on appeal, Court of Appeal, July 12, 10 o'clock, Osgood Hall, uh, on Tuesday morning. So uh, these are the and the CBC's arguments in the response. The whole thing. Now, don't expect anything fun, hilarious. This is law. This is about to do with those things you click that say, I agree. And what they're going to be able to do to you in Canada when you do that. This is a big issue. I only deal with big issues. And so, enjoy because it's your clicking I agree that's at stake so we can set some rules on what those clicks mean when you click I agree. Between John C. Termel, plaintiff appellant, and CBC's Dragon Den, defendant respondent, Court of Appeal for Ontario, file C-52849, appellant's back them. Part 1, the appeal. 1. The appellant John Termel appeals from the final judgment made at Brantford of Ontario Superior Court Justice Lofchick, dated September 27, 2010, dismissing an application for breach of contract. Overview of the case and issue. Appellant had been offered the opportunity to appear on CBC's Dragon's Den to ask 100 k for a 10% royalty in Brantford Bucks. When the show aired, no mention of the Brantford Royalty Bucks pitch was included with the few disjointed excerpts of non-related material. Appellant sued for breach of contract. Justice Lofchick dismissed the action, and this is the appeal. Because the appellant's notoriety in gambling, politics, law, economics, CBC's Dragon's Den editor Richard Marov invited the appellant to make a pitch to ask the Dragon's Den for a cash investment that had to return a profit. Exhibit book... Uh, da, da, da. Two, in 1984, appellant financed the original Let's Local Employment Trading System, Time Banking Freeware where unemployed mothers could earn hours of credit in a time bank by babysitting each other's children and such other useful time trading activities, which is spread around the world to the point appellant was invited to address the United Nations Millennium Assembly in 2000, resulting in Millennium Declaration C6 for an alternative interest-free Unilets time-based currency. 60% of Japanese now belong to the Furia Kipu Healthcare Hours Time Bank. Appellant's promotion of the Unilets and Canlets Time Banking Community Currency System is well known since the foundation of the Abolitionist Party in 1993. Unfortunately, 
appellant was prevented from pitching can lets because there is no inherent ask in a pitch to set up a can lets time bank. No matter how much I'd love to pitch to fix the nation's currency, I had to make a pitch that would profit the investors. But there is a second successful local currency model, not based on time, but on cash. I could pitch where an ask could be made. Just like Facebook will pay you 11 to 10 if you buy their ace bucks for cash, Appellant showed press reports about Toronto dollars, Calgary dollars, Pittsburgh plenties, Berkshires being used in Berkshire, Massachusetts, where buying in for 95 US cash got you 100 Berkshires used in local, but not international businesses. And Berkshires could be redeemed for cash at the same rate. Buy in for local chips to get a royalty while in town, cash out whatever you don't use when you leave. Appellant's ask on the Dragon's Den webpage was therefore clearly defined as 100k for a 10% royalty. Dragons would get 110,000 Brantford bucks to spend in Brantford stores for 100,000 Canadian cash, which would be held by the store owners as co-loans to balance the royalty they offer. Pre-bought goods, if you will. As more citizens buy in with cash for their royalties, each merchant keeps getting more pre-buy callable loans to pay down his debts while the cash sits idle. It's called the Sparta effect. I didn't mention that. I should have. It's in the video, June 30th, uh, John Termal cross-examination. Sixth, appellant gave the standard written consent to CBC for the complete editorial control of the Brantford Royalty Bucks pitch. They did not have to show it. They could show it in any way they wished. They had complete editorial control of Appellant's Brantford Royalty Bucks pitch. And of course, I'm hoping that when they have complete editorial control to do anything that's legal with it, not to do something that's illegal with it. Seven, the Brantford Bucks ask for 100K for 10% royalty was pitched and acknowledged in the first 30 seconds of the 15 minute taping. Okay, I explained how it worked. Uh, Robert Hervicek said, uh, so it's a 10% royalty stream? That's right, nothing else, nothing else. 30 seconds, done, explained, acknowledged. Uh, eight, on January 13, 2010, though the ask for 100K for 10% royalty and the Brantford Bucks was clearly on the title page of their web page. The edited version that was aired did not even mention the Brantford Bucks. 10% royalty. Nine. Instead of the CBC played a disjointed excerpts from the Can Let's explanation, which has no ask, and even titled it Product Can Let's Time Bank. Description. This Brantford man plans to overhaul the Canadian banking system by switching from cash to chips. So it wasn't the Time Bank presentation. It was the Brantford Bucks presentation I was forced to make. 10. On January 20th, 2010, appellant filed a statement of claim for breach of contract for not playing the pitch for Brantford royalty bucks and libel and slander for editing distortions. Not having filed a proper notice of libel within six weeks, the head of relief was dismissed by Judge Lofchick, and given the episode was later rebroadcast, and a new proper notice of libel and slander served for the new action below, that issue was not raised in this appeal of the breach of contract issue. 11 on September 27th, Just Loftic also dismissed the application for relief against the breach of contract, which is the basis of this appeal, on the basis of the consent form. Issues and arguments. The learned judge ruled in aired in the learned judge, sir. The learned judge aired in ruling the signed consent annuls the original offer to broadcast the appellant's choice of the Brantford royalty bucks pitch. The offer was to play the pitch of my choice. Ask 100K for 10% royalty. 
in Brantford, folks. Not the pitch of their choice. Ask for no return installing a can let's time banking overhaul of the national banking system. Appellant was limited to pitching for investment in the Brantford royalty bucks because there is no inherent ask in the can let's time bank reform. Respondent failed to show appellant's choice of pitch and instead showed its choice of pitch in an incoherent editing made to take, make the wrong pitch sound complicated. 15. Appellant submits that the title page can let's banking is proof they breached the deal by not playing the real Branford Royalty Bucks pitch I had really made and expected to be shown. So their own title where it said can let's time bank proves that they didn't show the right pitch. Order sought. Seeks an order overturning the decision of Justice Lofchick and ordering the trial of the issue because I want to know what a jury thinks my breach of contract is worth. Between John C. Termel, Plaintiff Appellant, and CBC Dragons Dan, Defendant Respondent, this is Appellant's Factum against Justice Arell and Returnable July 12th in two days, 2011. Part 1, The Appeal. The appellant John Termel makes a consolidated appeal from the initial final judgments made at Branford of Superior Court Judge Lofchick, and we've heard all those arguments and a few more coming up, dated September 27, 2010, and Justice Errol, C. 53732, dated March 17, 2011, that the prior signed consent bars claims for breach of contract or the tort of defamation. Both issues coming up now. Overview of the case and issue. Respondent Dra CBC Dragons then breached the terms of the original email offer to air the pitch of appellant's choice of ask 100k for 10% royalty Brantford bucks pitch. By instead airing something else edited to misrepresent the transaction and defame the appellant titled can let's pitch I should have put in. The courts below ruled the last minute, uninformed, signed consent, barred claims of breach of the original email offer and defamation. Statement of facts. The factum for C52849 details the facts already. The courts below ruled that the consent barred claims for breach of the original email offer and for defamation for the technicality of not filing a libel on time, but this second defamation I now brought up had to do with the second time they broadcast the show. On August 4th, despite no longer having any consent for the continued airing of the defamatory episode, respondent rebroadcast the episode and made it available for online viewing on the Dragon's Den website for seven months between January 14th and August 28th, 2010 when I filed the second complaint and they took it down. Five, appellant gave notice of libel and slander within the required six weeks and sued for defamation and breach of contract again. Judge Errol cited and agreed with Justice Lofchick in dismissing the application and <clears throat> ruling the consent barred both relief claimed. Though appellant has uploaded King of the Poppers on Dragon's Den for Branford Bucks 10% royalty at my site, johntrammell.com slash dragonsden.wmv, and it's also at YouTube, setting the smear job into perspective with the whole thing. Yet, a couple of hundred views of the truth can't compete with the millions who saw the one-minute defamation. Issues and Arguments whether the consent was unconscionably obtained by not including it with the information package sent earlier, but springing it on pictures just prior to the taping. That's what they do every time. B. If so, whether the consent trumped the choice of pitch in the original email offer. C. Whether such exculpatory clauses for quasi-intentional torts should be honored by the court. And I have a court in the States where they say, where when they try, when they did damage intentionally, their prior consent uninformed shouldn't count. 
So that's my precedent in the United States. There's a school of thought who say that when you damage people, that consent doesn't count. D, whether res judicata bars the first tort from being raised within the complaint about the rebroadcast pursuant to libel and slander act section six. Section six says if you do a, uh, an action, you can also include a previous time they defamed you and you didn't get them on time. So A, consent unconscionably obtained. Appellant submits that the failure to include the consent form in the contestant's guide so pitchers have ample time to study it and see their lawyer if necessary but then spring it on the contestants while they're most distracted just before their presentation can have no other purpose than to obtain uninformed rather than informed consent. So the purpose of springing it at the last minute apart from all the other information is so people don't read it, right? To say contestants are free to put off their taping to review the consent, even consult with a lawyer is the height of disingenuousness. Appellant cannot imagine even a small minority taking the time to read the 33 paragraph small print consent and that few have rescheduled their taping for such review. Not including the consent form with the original documentation shows completely bad faith and the consent should not be honored. Breach of contract. The original email offer to do the pitch of my choice was the inducement to participate in the Dragon's Den program. Appellant submits the signature on the original email offer was as legitimately endorsed by the CBC as the signature on the consent by me. The original email offer says it's my choice of pitch. The consent says they can edit it in any way they like even not show any of it. But showing some of it without the right pitch being included breached the deal. And their emailed signature on the original emailed offer is as valid as my ink signature on their consent. C. Prior exculpation for torts not honored. Oh, I should have said intentional torts. In Justice Errol's decision, he says, 11, the plaintiff further agreed by signing the consent that he may well be portrayed in disparaging, defamatory, embarrassing, or of an otherwise unfavorable nature which may expose him to public ridicule, humiliation, or condemnation. The plaintiff also agreed to paragraph 27 of the consent not to sue for any loss of damage uh, for damage, no matter how caused. I said, certainly appellant agrees that a true portrayal may be disparaging, embarrassing, or of an otherwise unfavorable nature, which may expose to public ridicule, humiliation, or condemnation. But a true portrayal cannot be defamatory. Defamation takes misrepresentation. It takes a lie. They can do whatever they want with the truth, no matter how they make me look with the truth but not with a lie. And not to damage with a lie intentionally. That's defamation, the tort. 12. Succinctly, from Carswell, the law of defamation in Canada. Summary, section 11, one, points out the necessary ethos of consent, where it is reasonable to conclude that I consented to the defamations which were published. Well, is it reasonable to conclude that I consented to the defamations that were published? Uh, section 11.2 states that consent is an absolute defense to libel and slander. So, 14, there is a difference before, between informed consent and not. 15. Section 11.2, plaintiff cannot claim damages for broadcast which he's authorized or invited. And appellant did not invite the defamation by the distortion. Especially the second time. It was the defendant who invited plaintiff to end up defamed. I never invited it. They invited me. 17. Quote, continues Carswell, This defense is premised upon the doctrine of valenti non fiat injuria, willingness to let the defamation occur. Well, I'm willing to let everything else occur, but not lying with it. 
If a plaintiff has invited the publication of the defamatory matter, where it is reasonable to conclude, the plaintiff has consented to the remarks. So, such informed consent of the remarks is only possible before a complete broadcast, not prior to an edited broadcast. Truth is always already a separate defense to an action of defamation. 20. Appellant does submit that since truthful words could not be defamatory, only disparaging, shaming, it takes some untruth to defame, to damage with a lie, and that consent to untruth, to damage with a lie, should not have been a right claimed and should not be honored, like that Ontario, uh, uh, that U.S. court said. Section 11.3.2, when the plaintiff invites, requests, or consents to a statement, an action for defamation is barred. Yeah, if I know about what the statement is. The defense of consent is certainly applicable where the plaintiff expressly authorizes the publication of the def defamatory information by signing a release. Yeah, not a prior release. How can you know what it's going to be? However, the consent must be voluntary and not obtained by fraud, duress, or coercion. And, of course, springing it on me at the last minute is duress and coercion. The inequality of the parties in the situation coerced plaintiff to accept the defendant's terms on unconscionably short notice. 23. Quotes from Carswell Still, the defense of consent will generally prevail where plaintiff requests publication of the precise information about which he later complains. Well, I didn't know what it was going to be, did I? So how could I complain about the precise information? So... That just cannot happen without being informed of the edited version being used. The defense of consent will also generally prevail where the plaintiff requests publication of the precise information which he or she later complains. And since plaintiff had no idea the show would be edited at all, let alone in such a defamatory way, since there was no precise information for the plaintiff to consent to until the edited libel and slander were broadcast, such exculpatory clause should not be honored by the court. 27. One American court has held that since defamation is quasi-intentional tort, they meant to hurt you on purpose. Such documents, consents in advance, are against public policy and such exculpatory clause will not be honored by the court. A second school of judicial thought suggests such consent in advance, exculpatory clause, should not be honored by Canadian courts either. There are certain rights that should never be claimed or honored, the right to harm someone. Truth can be used to ridicule, disparage, dishonor, shame someone, but not to defame. Truth is an absolute defense to the claim of defamation. One can't defame with the truth. It takes a misrepresentation to defame. It takes a lie that causes damage. So, should a right to lie to damage be included in such consent without the clearest of terms? First tort, D. First tort with second tort under Section 6. Section 6 states, where such an application is brought within that period, the action may include a claim for any other libel against the plaintiff by the defendant in the same newspaper or same broadcasting station within a period of one year before the commencement of the action. So I'm talking about my second action, and I included my complaint from the first one that got dismissed on the technicality that I hadn't filed the first form. 30. The first claim was rejected for the technicality of failing to file the original notice of libel and slander, not on merit. So the court erred in ruling that the issue was a stopped by dismissal of the first statement of claim. The matter was not decided pursuant to res judicata, but merely barred by technicality for the first tort. It should have been allowed to be included. E. Rebroadcast required new consent. From Carswell. In note 17, Butler v. Southern, consent is a narrow defense to defamation. Consent must be clearly established. Consent must be given with respect to each publication of defamatory material. 
Here again, there's the constant implication of consent has to have narrowness of informed consent. It is not reasonable to conclude that there was consent to the defamatory words when the release was signed before the use of the words was even known. Though appellant may have consented to the first publication of the defamatory material, appellant certainly did not consent to the second publication on TV nor the permanent publication on the web. Judge Errol asked why they rebroadcast once I complained. No answer. 33. With the novel issue of permanent libel on their website having now arisen, as well as the two broadcast libels on their TV frequencies, the issue of consent to such permanent defamation is even more imperative. The appellant and all I could do is stick my video up that's got a couple of hundred views of the whole show while everybody just saw millions the one minute hatchet job. Conclusion 34. Appellant wants the CBC to remove the claim to immunity from the criminal quasi intentional tort of defamation from that paragraph of the consent form as unconscionable. Immunity from fraud someday too? 35. Appellant wants CBC to send that most important consent with the information kit in advance and stop springing it on people at the last minute to obtain uninformed consent. 36. Appellant wants CBC to be punished for failing to show the 10% royalty Branford Bucks pitch. And 37. Appellant wants CBC to be punished for defamatory misrepresentations and omissions intended to damage my good engineering reputation. Order sought. Appellant seeks an order overturning the decisions below for summary judgment so that the claims for defamation by the second tort and for breach of email contract be tried. John Turnell, Brantford, June 19th. Consolidated Factum of the Respondent. Overview, Part 1. 1. These appeals both arise out of claims regarding an episode of The Dragon's Den, a CBC television program on which the plaintiff appellant John Turmel appeared. Mr. Turmel appeared in the program and made a confusing pitch to The Dragon's for a $100,000 investment to start up a local currency system in Brantford, Ontario based on poker chips. The Dragons declined to invest in Mr. Turmel's proposal. Mr. Turmel claims he was defamed by his portrayal in the Dragons Den episode and that CBC breached a contract with him. Two, Mr. Turmel commenced two actions seeking damages that allegedly resulted from the broadcast of the Dragons Den episode. Both were dismissed pursuant to motions for summary judgment brought by CBC. In the first action, giving rise to this appeal, Justice Lofchick held that the defamation claim was barred as a result of Mr. Turmel's failure to deliver the required notice under Section 5.1 of the Libel and Slander Act. Mr. Turmel has not appealed from this aspect of that judgment. Justice Lofchick also found that the consent that was signed by Mr. Turmel prior to his appearance on the Dragon's Den episode was a bar to the entire claim, including any claim for breach contract, even if properly pleaded. Three, in the second action, commenced following a rebroadcast of the same episode, Justice Errol found that many of the issues that Mr. Turmel attempted to raise were res judicata, already decided. He agreed with Justice Lofchick's findings regarding the consent. He confirmed that this contract was not unconscionable. Further, Justice Errol held that nothing in the broadcasted episode, including the fact that it was edited from the taping, was capable of defamation. Four, that Mr. Turmel has not and cannot identify how either of the learned judges erred in fact or law. There is simply no basis for this honorable court to interfere with either of the decisions to grant summary judgment and to dismiss Mr. Turmel's claims against CBC. Accordingly, these appeals should be dismissed with costs payable forthwith. Part 2 The Facts A. Dragon's Den 
Dragon's Den is a program broadcast from the CBC Broadcast Center in Toronto and distributed to CBC television stations across Canada. It features entrepreneurs who pitch business proposals to a panel of elite Canadian business persons, the Dragons, based on their assessment of the financial soundness and the viability of the participants' proposals. The Dragons offer advice, endorsement, and sometimes investment financing. The producers of the Dragon's Den select individuals to participate in tapings based on their judgment as to which proposals and or entrepreneurs might contribute to the program's public interest and or entertainment value. However, an invitation to participate in the taping is not a guarantee that the pitch will be broadcast on the Dragon's Den episode. The producers have sole discretion to broadcast some, all, or none of it, and the participants are so advised. Unless they promise to per broadcast a certain particular part of it, what I originally was promised, and then didn't. B. Mr. Turmel's taping. Mr. T Seven. Mr. Turmel has an extensive background and an outspoken public profile in political activism for, among other things, his gambling activities. On May 27, 2009, Richard Meroff, a producer of Dragon's Den, contacted Mr. Tremell and invited him to attend a taping to pitch a business proposal to the Dragons. Mr. Meroff did not know what business projects that Mr. Tremell might be working on, but he explained that Mr. Tremell had a unique background and public speaking skill that might be interesting for the show. Eight. Mr. Turmel agreed to participate in the taping and advised Mr. Merov that he would pitch worldwide interest-free time banking. No, I didn't. I couldn't. Mr. Turmel had never seen an episode of The Dragon's Den, although Mr. Merov suggested that he might find out about the show and waste, watch past episodes over the internet. Mr. Turmel chose not to do so before his taping. True, I didn't even watch it. 9. Prior to his taping, Mr. Turmel received a copy of the Dragon's Den Contestant's Guide 2009. The Dragon's Den producers sent the Contestant's Guide to all entrepreneur participants before they attend the taping. Mr. Turmel understood that he was to read the Contestant's Guide carefully, and he reviewed it before attending his taping. The Contestant's Guide advised Mr. Turmel of the following. A. There's no guarantee the participant will appear in the Dragon's Den episode or that making a pitch will result in an investment from the Dragon's Participants are responsible for understanding all the rules and regulations in the Dragon's Den about which they could get further details in the consent and release form that they were required to sign and read, which they didn't include in the package. C. Participants should convey information about their proposals and make their pitch to the Dragon's in an easy-to-understand manner. And I made it in 26 seconds or 24 seconds, and it was acknowledged in the next six. How easy a manner could that have been? Anything that was discussed on camera may be broadcast on the show, and I didn't mind that as long as they broadcast the original offered email pitch for the Bucks. And E, a pitch may take on a life of its own. Anything goes. Well, yeah, anything went. You should see the video. C, the consent. 11. Mr. Tremell arrived at his taping at the CBC studio on May 31, 2009. A Dragon's Den member handed Mr. Tremell a copy of the consent and told him to read it carefully. <clears throat> Mr. Tremell was required to consent if he wanted to participate in the taping. He was given ample time to read the consent and was free to ask for more time to review it. And for just a moment now, I'm going to show you what I'm going to use as my main prop uh, on Tuesday morning at the Court of Appeal. Here's a copy of the consent. And just to show you the kind of type it had, this is how dense it is, okay? And there are, take a quick look here, 33 paragraphs worth. Ta-da! And they expect everybody to sit down in the height of excitement before their presentations and read this consent form. I had ample time, they said, and I was one of the first guys up. So, I'll read that again. 11. Mr. Tremell arrived at the taping of the CBC studio. <laughs> no, and I'll leave it on the desk at the court so everybody can see it. Uh, a Dragon's Den member handed Mr. Tremell a copy of the consent and told him to read it carefully. 
Mr. Jamel was required to sign the consent if he wanted to participate in the taping. He's given ample time to read the consent, was free to ask for more time to review it. Had he asked for more time, his taping would have been rescheduled. However, Mr. Tremell did not indicate to anyone that he had concerns or questions about the consent. And of course, like I explained in all my testimony, it's because I presume they're not asking for stuff they got no right to have, like to hurt me, okay, a criminal offense. Twelve, instead, Mr. Tremell provided detailed information where he was requested on the consent to do so, and more significantly, he signed directly under the sentence that said, I agree to the conditions set out above, and that all the information given in this form may be used in the program at the producer's sole discretion. Thirteen, for greater certainty, the consent includes the following provisions. Here we go. By signing this consent and release, I represent that I have read, understood, and voluntarily agreed to abide by its terms and conditions. Producer requires me to enter into this agreement in order to be considered as a contestant on a program, and I deem it to be in my best interest to enter into this agreement. I acknowledge that by signing this agreement, I'll be giving up certain legal rights I may have against producer, sponsors of the program, and others, but not from criminal offense. Five, I hereby irrevocably consent to producers filming, taping, and or recording me, with or without my knowledge, and for use in connection with the production and exploitation of the program. I hereby grant to producer, its assignees, licensees, agents, and affiliates, the right in any and all media now known and hereafter devised throughout the universe in, or in perpetuity to use and reuse my appearance in the business proposal during all phases of production of the program, including but not limited to the right to use my name, voice, likeness, biographical information, and business proposal in any manner whatsoever at producer's sole discretion. As long as they don't defame me with it as long as they present it in a truthful manner. But if they present it in a false manner, I don't think that's the same thing. I understand and agree that the telecast and or other exploitation of the program, look at this. She wants me to read it all, in which I appear if and that's just too much. All right, paragraph nine, she reads, I understand that I may reveal, and other parties may reveal information about me that's a personal, private, embarrassing, or unfavorable nature, which information may be factual and or fictional. I further understand that my appearance, depiction, and or portrayal in the program may be disparaging, defamatory, embarrassing, or of otherwise unfavorable nature, which may expose me to public ridicule, humiliation, and condemnation. I acknowledge and agree that the producer shall have the right to include any all information, any all appearances, depictions, portrayals in the program as edited by the producer at sole discretion and to broadcast and otherwise exploit the program, da, da, da. 27. I hereby irrevocably agree I'll not sue or claim against any other participants of the program or the released parties, da, da, da. 33. I've been given ample opportunity to read and I've carefully read this entire agreement. I lied. We all do when we click, I agree, on those buttons of conditions on the internet. We all lie. We're all coerced. In addition, I've been given the opportunity to, and I'm here to advise to, have this agreement reviewed by legal counsel of my choice. Yeah, in the half an hour before the show. I certify that I've made an investigation of the facts relevant to this agreement. Well, I just got it. What kind of an investigation can I be swearing I made of it? And of all the matters pertaining thereto, as I've deemed necessary, true, as I deem necessary, I looked at the five pages and I said they better not be asking for something they got no right to ask about that I'm going to have to complain about and fight about later. And then they did. And I fully understand the contents of this agreement. I'm a sound mind. I intend to uh, and agree to be legally bound by this agreement. Each statement which I have made in this agreement is true. So the only issue is whether or not when they said, you, we're going to play the pitch of your choice, despite this consent, did they have the right to not play the pitch of my choice, but then use the other stuff? That's the question. 
D, the broadcast of January 13th, 2010 and August 4th, 2010. Mr. Turpel pitched a business proposal seeking a $100,000 investment from the Dragons to start up a local currency system in Brantford, Ontario, based on poker chips. And you notice she can never say Brantford Bucks, okay? As can be seen from the recording transcript of the taping, Mr. Turmel's 15-minute pitch left the Dragons very confused. And I say that the first 30 seconds showed that the Dragons were very clued in because the pitch was made and acknowledged in that time. They were confused about the time bank stuff, but not the Brantford Buck stuff. The Dragons did not give Mr. Turmel the investment he sought. Yes. 15 on January 13, 2010, approximately one minute of Mr. Turmel's pitch was broadcasted by the CBC on the Dragon's Den episode. The broadcast portion conveyed to the viewers that Mr. Turmel's pitch was confusing by not showing it and showing something else. Agreed. And difficult to follow by showing half of my statement and not the rest, and then half of my statement and not the conclusion, agreed. It, they made it difficult to follow. It informed the public that if a participant is not clear, hey, it informed the public as if they cut it up to make a participant not seem clear in explaining his or her proposal, he or she is not likely to receive his investment from the Dragons. CBC subsequently re-aired his episode on August 4th, 2010. E, action one, and CBC's motion for summary judgment before Lofchick. On January 20th, 2010, Mr. Turmel commenced an action against CBC, alleging that the broadcast on January 13th damaged and defamed him, action one. He did not serve any notice of that claim before commencing the action or thereafter within six weeks of the broadcast. CBC moved for summary judgment on that basis that Mr. Turmel had not complied with the mandatory notice required in section 5.1 of the Libel and Slander Act. 17. In response to CBC's motion, Mr. Turmel took the position that Action 1 included a claim for damages for breach of contract. Subsequently, although it had not been properly pleaded, there was a full record of evidence on the issue of breach of contract. No, there wasn't. And it was fully argued in the summary judgment motion. CBC maintained there is no genuine issue requiring a trial, as breach of contract had not been properly pleaded, and in any event, the consent was a complete bar to Mr. Turmel's claims for defamation and breach of contract. 18. On September 27th, Justice Lofchick uh, granted the CBC's motion and dismissed action number one. He held that there was no genuine issue requiring a trial in respect to the defamation because Mr. Turmel failed to give the required notice. Mr. Turmel does not challenge that part of Mr. Judge Lofchick's decision in this appeal. I lost on a technicality. Justice Lofchick also held the breach of contract was not pleaded, but if it had been, such claim was barred by the consent and did not give rise to a genuine issue requiring a trial. 20. Justice Lofchick's specific findings include the following. A. Prior to his taping, Mr. Turmel received a copy of the contestant's guide. Yeah, 10 days before. He understood that he was to read it carefully and advise Mr. Turmel that anything that is discussed on camera could be broadcast on the show. That participants are responsible for understanding all the rules and regulations of the Dragon's Den, the details of what the rules of the Dragon can be found in the consent, which I didn't get, which participants must read and sign, and that a pitch may take on a life of its own and anything goes. B, the judge is reading. Prior to the taping, Mr. Turmel was given a copy of the consent and told to read it carefully. Mr. Turmel had adequate time to review the consent. Yeah, yeah, sure. And to ask questions about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And to have it reviewed by a lawyer providing independent legal advice. Yeah, yeah, sure. He signed the consent without asking any questions or raising any concerns. He made a calculated decision to sign the contract in order to participate in the taping. Yes. Coerced. And received the opportunity to ask the Dragons for a hundred thousand investment in his proposal. Yes. Everybody does. Everybody signs a consent. Nobody reads it. C. Mr. Turmel signed the consent directly under a sentence that reads, I agree to the conditions set out above and that all the information given in the form may be used in the program at the producer's sole discretion. D, the consent is a contract, and it is the only contract between Mr. Turmel and CBC. 
So I guess the email signature on their offer of, to do my pitch doesn't count. The obligation which Mr. Termell alleges CBC breached is not only not a term of the consent or of any contract between CBC and Mr. Termell, it is expressly contradicted by the consent's terms. There's nothing unconscionable about the consent. Its substantive terms are not unfair, nor is the consent improvident for Mr. Termell. Wow, he thinks. Justice locked you. E. Mr. Termell agreed that CBC made no promise and had no obligation to broadcast his pitch at all. Brantford Bucks that the producers had full discretion to broadcast all, some, or none of his pitch, Brantford Bucks, and that they could edit, cut, alter, rearrange, adapt, dub, or otherwise revise his pitch if he decided. Brantford Bucks, but not the other stuff, unless Brantford Bucks was in it. Not the supplementary stuff without the main stuff. F. There's no genuine issue for trial with respect to defamation, breach of contract, even if pleaded, or any other cause of action. Action 2 and CBC's motion for summary judgment before Errol J. On October 27, 2020, Mr. Termell delivered a notice of appeal from Justice Lofchick's decision. On November 12, 2010, he commenced the second action, number 2, for breach of contract and defamation in respect of rebroadcasts on January 13th and August 4th of 2010. 22. The claim, in, the claim in Action 2 is based on the exact same facts as the claim in Action 1. In his pleading, Mr. Tremell completely ignored the findings of Judge Lofchick. Well, I agreed where he was right, disagreed where he was wrong. He raised issues regarding unconscionability and enforceability of the consent and alleged that there was some other contract between him and CBC governing his participation on Dragon's Day. CBC defended Action 2 on November 25, 2010 and served a notice of motion for summary judgment on the same day. The primary ground for the motion was that there was no genuine issue requiring a trial because Mr. Turmel's second action was barred by issue estoppel, cause of action, and for doctrine of abuse of process. On November 27th, Errol J. granted CBC's motion and dismissed the second action. He found that the facts as set out by Justice Lofchick were the same in the case before him, the only additional facts being the second airing and posting of the episode online. Pretty important second facts. Justice Errol's analysis and conclusions on the issues of motion are as follows. Mr. Justice Lofchick dealt in detail with the consent, and I agree with his findings. He also concluded that even if the plaintiff had pleaded breach of contract, there would still have been no genuine issue for trial because the consent was a complete bar. I agree. The consent, which I find the plaintiff fully understood, read, and accepted, makes it abundantly clear that CBC had sole and exclusive rights to the taping and to edit and use it in any way or any time it wished, and to maliciously defame. The plaintiff further agreed by signing the consent that he may be portrayed in disparaging, defamatory, embarrassing, otherwise unfavorable nature, which may expose me to public ridicule, humiliation, or condemnation. The plaintiff also agreed, pursuant to paragraph 27, not to sue for any loss or damage, no matter how caused. I find that there is no evidence that the consent and the release were not entered into freely, voluntarily, and with full knowledge and understanding of the plaintiff. And I had showed the consent to Justice Errol, just like this. And he's saying, there's no indication I didn't get into this freely, that I read it. Uh, no evidence has been led that it was in any way unconscionable, and I said spring it on me at the last minute was. And like Justice Lovchick, I find as a fact it was not springing it on me, unconscionable. As such, it's a complete bar to this lawsuit and there's no genuine issue for trial. I've reviewed in detail the transcript of the episode that the plaintiff complains defamed him. There are no words in that transcript that are capable of slander or libel. No, there's just the cutting out of my statements and having everybody laugh at me. 
Indeed, the plaintiff argued before me that the real defamation is the editing down to 57 seconds, and the public not seeing the full pitch is the libel and slander. I disagree. Well, so do I. I said that what they showed made me look funny and didn't explain what I'd said, misrepresented what I'd said, and that's defamation. The public saw and heard only the 57 seconds. The conclusion of the dragons that the pitch they heard made no sense to them is not liable as slander. Well, they caught on in 30 seconds. He knew it. I explained it. It did make sense to them. They even talked about the vigorish later. Maybe I should have offered them a few more points than 10. So the judge didn't get that part, obviously, what that meant. Um, it did make sense to them. The final issue is that of res judicata. CBC argues this matter has already been dealt with in its entirety by Justice Lopchick. The plaintiff urges me to find the facts are different in the case at bar because he pleaded breach of contract and gave notice under the act. I disagree. The facts of both cases are identical. Justice Lopchick dealt with breach of contract as if pleaded and found no genuine issue for trial. He also found the consent to be a complete bar, not to the defamation. I had a right to raise it again the second time they did it to me. I have come to the same conclusion. I find there are no new facts or new issues. Yes, there was a new offense. The action should be dismissed under the doctrine of res judicata. For all the reasons given here, I find there is no genuine issue for trial, and this action is dismissed. Reasons of Justice Arrow. Part 3 questions proposed to the court trying to ignore mine. Mr. Turmel has not appealed from Justice Lofchick's dismissal of his defamation claim because he was right. It was a technicality, couldn't do it. The only issue in his first appeal is whether Justice Lofchick erred in finding that the consent bars any claim for breach of contract. This appeal is without merit. Mr. Turmel is raising questions of fact and questions of mix mixed fact and law, a high degree of deference is owed to Justice Lopchick in this regard, a presumption that Mr. Turmel has not displaced. He should be presumed right, and Turmel hasn't convinced me he shouldn't be. 26. Mr. Turmel argues that CBC, quote, did not have consent to omit the royalty pitch completely and then use supplementary material as it had for the pitch. In making this argument, Mr. Trammell relies on a purported original offer that somehow displaces the consent. It doesn't displace it, it shares it. There are two contracts. One, I get to do the pitch of my choice, and two, they get to use the truth to portray it any way they want. This position was advanced before and correctly rejected by the learned judge. The appeal ought to be dismissed and the judgment of Justice Lockchick should be affirmed. 27. In the second appeal, Mr. Turmel takes issue with Justice Errol's findings that A, there's no evidence that consent and release were not entered into freely, though he'd seen the five-pager sprung at me in the last, just before the show, voluntarily and with the full knowledge and understanding of the plaintiff. B, there's no evidence that consent was in any way unconscionable other than the fact that it was sprung at me at the last minute instead of being sent with the original kit. C. CBC had sole and exclusive rights to the taping and to edit it and use it in any way at any time they wished to the pitch that they promised they'd make that anything else they could do was okay. D. There are no words in the transcript that are capable of libel and slander. That's right, they were misrepresentations by omission. And E. The consent is a complete bar. And I'm saying some courts have said that when you deal with a quasi-intentional tort like defamation to hurt people, which is a crime, uh, you can't rely on prior uninformed consents and they won't be honored. And that's what I'm asking this court to do. 28. Again, this appeal is without merit. These questions of fact and mixed law were, in fact, were all addressed by Justice Errol and his decision should be accorded deference. Mr. Turmel has failed to, indeed cannot, identify any error that was committed by the learned judge. Well, they said it wasn't unconscionable when it was. The court should also dismiss this appeal and affirm Justice Errol's judgment. Issues in the law. 29. It is respectfully submitted that Mr. Turmel's appeals raise the following issues. A. Whether Lofchick J. or Errol made any palpable or overriding error of fact. B, whether the terms of the consent are unconscionable. 
C, whether Termel raised any genuine issue of breach of contract, and D, whether Termel raised any genuine issue of defamation. A, no palpable or and overriding error in finding of fact. 30. A judge's findings of fact at first instance can only be set aside on appeal when they are based on palpable and overriding error. There is no such error with the findings that the consent is the only contract between the parties and that it was not unconscionable. That it was not unconscionable. And that it was not unconscionable. Unconscionably obtained. These issues were fully argued before both learned judges who independently reached the same conclusions, which are the only ones that are available on the evidence. 31. Mr. Turmel gave affidavit evidence about the circumstances in which he signed the consent and was cross-examined on that evidence. It's undisputed that prior to the taping, he had ample opportunity to familiarize himself with the format of Dragon's Den and to see how participants and proposed might be portrayed in the program. Mr. Turmel participated willingly in the taping on the terms set out in the consent. By signing it, he expressly acknowledged and agreed that the Dragon's Den producers had the right to include any disparaging, defamatory, embarrassing, or otherwise unfavorable depictions of him in the broadcast as edited in her sole discretion. There was no error of finding that Mr. Turmel voluntarily signed the consent and that he had read, understood, and accepted its terms and that's the only point in the whole issue is that one word. Whether they should be able to include a crime in their consent immunity. B. The consent which bars all of the appellant's claims is not unconscionable. 32. Paragraph 27 of the consent is clear and unequivocal. Mr. Turmel irrevocably agreed that he will not sue or claim against the release parties for any damage loss or harm to him or his property, howsoever caused, resulting and arising out of any connection with his participation and appearance in or elimination from the program or activities associated with the program. Accordingly, Justice Lofchick and Justice Errol were correct to dismiss the claims for defamation and breach of contract, and I guess no one should be able to write into a consent that I won't be able to sue you. 33. Mr. Turmel had ample time to review the consent before his taping. He also had the opportunity to ask questions about it and to have it reviewed by a lawyer providing independent legal advice. Yes, all in the 15 minutes to the half an hour I had. He did neither. Instead, he made a calculated decision to sign the consent in order to participate and receive the opportunity to ask for a $100,000 investment. Yes. Everybody does. 34. Unconscionability, which is to be assessed at the time the contract was formed, not be established here. The record confirms, and Justice Lofchick and Justice Errol correctly found, that there was no special relationship or inequality of bargaining power between the parties. Mr. Turmel was aware he had to sign the consent in order to participate in the taping. He had participated in similar television programs in the past and is familiar with the signing releases as conditions of participation. He deemed it to be in his best interest to sign the consent and proceed with the taping. Even if he took a gamble in doing so, the fact that CBC then did something that he now disapproves of does not entitle him to avoid his bargain. Well, if you didn't keep our original bargain, yes. And if you did something criminal, yes. 35. CBC is entitled to rely on Mr. Turmel's signature as indicating his acceptance of the terms of the consent. And I'm entitled to use the email signature on the original offer where they said I get the pitch of my choice also. The consent contained in capital letters and directly above Mr. Turmel's signature the words I agree to the conditions set out above and the email said you can do the pitch of your choice. Under cross-examination, he admitted reading this portion of the consent before he signed it. Question. That says, I agree to the conditions set above and all the information given in this form may be used in the program and producer's sole discretion. I said, absolutely, I don't mind. Right, so you read that, you signed it. Yes. Uh, even if Mr. Turmel did not read all of the consent before signing it, he did so at his own risk. 
As this court has held, a person is bound by an agreement to which he's put his signature, whether he's read its contents or has chosen to leave them unread. And I say it's a new world with the interest make, internet making everybody go click, I accept. Failure to read a contract before signing it is not a legally acceptable basis for refusing to abide by it. It is if it breaks another contract that's linked, and it is if it breaks the law. You got a right to rape my wife, defraud me, what next? C, no contract was breached. 37, there is simply no evidence that CBC had a contract with Mr. Termel to broadcast his choice of pitch. And this raises no genuine issue for trial. On the contrary, and as Mr. Termel has conceded, the consent authorized CBC to broadcast all, some, or none of his, his presentation. And furthermore, if CBC did decide to broadcast some of it, to edit, cut, alter, rearrange, adapt, dub, and otherwise revise it in the discretion of the producers. Yeah, but you gotta still leave it my pitch. The obligation that Mr. Tremell alleges was breached is only is not only not a term of the consent or any contract between CBC and Mr. Tremell. It is expressly contradicted by the terms of the consent. No, it doesn't. Just because it says they can do anything they want in their promise to give me the pitch of my choice doesn't mean you can now not give me the pitch of my choice. Justice Lofchick and Justice Arrow did not err in dismissing the claim for breach of contract. 38. For greater certainty, there's no contract created by the email from Mr. Merov to Mr. Tremell on May 27, 2009. The email was an invitation, not a contract. For Mr. Turnell to participate in the taping of the Dragon's Den. Even if it were a contract, the only offer was to pitch to the Dragon's There is no offer, promise, or representation regarding what, whether Mr. Turnell's pitch would actually be broadcast. And if so, what that broadcast may contain. Well, yeah, it should contain my pitch. The email was completely silent as to what, if anything, might be ultimately broadcast. That's right. My choice of pitch, but I had to tailor it to the ask for money. Bradford Bucks. 39. In any event, the email could not give rise to a contract since Mr. Turmel himself changed his pitch from what he proposed in his response. If these emails could amount to contract, Mr. Turmel himself did not feel bound by the terms and made a pitch about local currency rather than worldwide interest-free time banking, time-based banking as he had offered. Right! I didn't make the pitch about time banking. I couldn't. I switched. I chose Brantford Bucks, 10% royalty for an investment of money. And now they're saying he changed his pitch. Well, that's proof that you didn't play the right pitch. I changed my pitch and you played the wrong one. And they didn't change the title. They should have changed the title to Brantford Bucks asking for 100K if they knew I changed my pitch. So why'd they leave Ken Let's Time Bank wanting 100K for 10% royalty, which made no sense? D, the broadcast was not defamatory. Mr. Termel has not pleaded any particular words, images, sound, and or effect, edit effects of the broadcast that would be capable of satisfying the legal test for defamation. Well, if playing half statements and uh, misrepresenting the whole pitch um, isn't what it is. Moreover, he's not alleged any damages arising from the broadcast. Well, I want to ask a jury what they think the damage was to my reputation. As such, the claim for defamation discloses no reasonable cause of action, and it is plain and obvious that it will not succeed. Justice Lopchick and Justice Errol did not err in dismissing the claim for defamation. Only Errol dismissed the claim for defamation. Lopchick's was the technicality. Not fair to make them both sound the same. 41. Nothing in the words or editing complained of, in their natural or ordinary meaning, would tend to lower Mr. Turmel in the estimation of a reasonable viewer, or expose Mr. Turmel to hatred, contempt, or ridicule. That's right, all they used was, hey, 
these chips inflate and these government uh, d these chips don't inflate and these government coins do what's going on same hardware and then the other one was a hey, they tell us in economics that inflation is an increase in the money chasing the goods shift a that's it that was all they played so yeah of course those words did not but there were half statements that meant nothing the portions of Mr. Turmel's pitch that were included in the broadcasts did not misrepresent or differ from his presentation at the taping. So they're saying that my going, hey, these chips don't inflate, these government coins do, hardware is the same, must be a software problem, is no different than dropping must be a software problem. And my saying economics teaches shift A, inflation, and increase in the money chasing the goods, and they drop, I'm the discoverer of shift B, inflation, same money chasing less goods after foreclosure, and or differ from his presentation at the taping. Well, of course they did. They cut out the conclusions. Broadcasting his pitch in its entirety, or edited in the manner he now proposes, would not materially change the public's perception of Mr. Turmel or his confusing business proposal. Well, they didn't hear my business proposal. That's the point. And how confusing was it? Well, they got it in the first 30 seconds. 42. Mr. Turmel's claim is based on what was left out of the broadcast. Yeah, my conclusion. However, this court has emphasized that it is the words that are actually used in the broadcast that must be considered, given that Mr. Turmel's business proposal and presentation were confusing to the dragons and to the public, and I'm saying given the edited version that was presented was confusing, the portions that were broadcast did not create any different impression from the portions that he argues should have been broadcast. And now you can go and watch the whole thing yourself on YouTube and see for yourself whether or not it's the same. The actual words are at an incomplaint of are simply not capable of supporting any defamatory meaning. Or, or requested, CBC requests that these appeals be dismissed with costs payable forthwith. Well, two last points. Now, I had put my whole show, and I had to split it up into four, three 15-minute sections for YouTube, and it was picked up by a French video channel called Watt.TV, and they pre-titled my title, which was King of the Poppers on Dragon's Den for Brantford Bucks 10% Royalty, and they pre-titled it, John Takes on Dumb Millionaires. <laughs> so I went and posted a copy of the link over at the Dragon's Den site so they could find out John takes on dumb millionaires. So final conclusion. What's great about Canada is I have the option to try to protest what I think is improper regulation and putting men with power on the spot to grant relief of benefit to everyone. Because let's face it, they should not be allowed to put things into a consent form they shouldn't be allowed to do. And the fact they do means that you should be allowed to challenge the consent form even if it says you can. And that's what I'm doing. I want these flaws in consent forms. I want it made clear you can't break the law just because you said so in a consent form. Think about how many sites you join and click I agree to their contract without thought. What if one of the clauses says you can't sue if they defraud you or use information to damage you in a way that would be charged criminally without such uninformed consent? Should such a clause be honored by the courts? One U.S. court said no because defamation was a in quasi-intentional tort meant to damage and that clause in the prior consent was not to be honored. Makes sense to me. I grant every right they claim without even looking that makes sense. If they claim a right they have no right to claim that does not make sense, then I should be able to ask a judge not to honor it. And the fact they put in a clause that says I can't ask a judge not to shouldn't be allowed either. I think the consent should be more for what they have a right to do rather than the consent to what they don't have a right to do. Tell me this is an equality issue 
I'm proud to have brought before the court. If I win, those bad clauses in the online contracts you sign won't rule the day. Companies have to know their consents can be challenged if they claim something they shouldn't have claimed, like ability to do criminal libel to damage intentionally. So, big issues at stake, even though it's a little guy against, you know, a David and Goliath story, the point is I got one heck of a slingshot and some pretty good rocks.